Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be talking about Tears of the Kingdom. So I finished the game just a few days ago and I gave it some thoughts, you know, slept on it. And basically here I am now with the kind of written out, you know, review-ish sort of first impression or at least first playthrough sort of impression of the game. Um, so as I've sort of mentioned in my previous video about a year ago um, of the Phantom Hourglass, uh, I've played just about every Zelda game, um, that I could reasonably get my hands on, um, so, essentially, I played every single game except for the original Zelda and Zelda 2, um, and the Oracle games and the Four Sword games, but pretty much other than that, I've played just about everything, um, at least for what's considered mainline, because, like, I haven't played, like, Link's crossbow training, but, like, that's not really, no one really cares too much about that one. Uh, it's not like a mainline Zelda, but yeah, with that out of the way, um, so my thoughts on this game prior to it launching, um, from what I'd seen in like the first few trailers that I watched, um, cause I tried to sort of avoid the la like the latter trailers just to kind of go in as blind as possible. Uh, but you know what I've seen from like a, the directs and the initial E3 2019 trailer, um, I thought it was looking pretty good. It seemed to be, like, a bit more darker in tone than the other. Um, at least, it seemed to be a little bit more darker in tone from Breath of the Wild. But, um, I don't know, I thought, I was optimistic thinking it was gonna be good, because Zelda's one of my favorite game series, so, um, yeah. So, I, I mean, new mainline Zelda, that, that's gotta be good. So, uh, overview of the plot really quick is, so, after Breath of the Wild... Um, Zelda and Link start exploring, like, the underground caverns of Hyrule Castle, uh, and then they discover Ganondorf, and then he kind of messes everything up and, you know, starts the plot, um, and yeah, so you kind of just have to stop him. Basic Zelda plot, but, you know, it's obviously more complicated than that, but that's kind of the premise of a lot of them, is just beat Ganondorf. Um, but yeah, just like Breath of the Wild, you can just go straight to the end if you want, you don't only really need to do the main quest, you know, just go straight to the, and if you should so, please, you know, speedrunning, you know, under an hour, but anyway, um, back to the, just going to the pros and cons as I usually do in these videos, um, one thing I noticed is that it's, it's a little bit subtle in some areas, but I did appreciate that they have upgraded the graphics, um, in some ways, because, um, you know, Breath of the Wild was also a Wii U game that was essentially ported onto Switch for its launch, um, but now that that's now specifically just for Switch, they're able to do a little bit more with the improved hardware. So yeah, some little things, like I know Fire just like looks better, and sometimes like the sun in the distance will also look better. Um, but you know, I'm not a huge graphics snob, but I did appreciate that there were little things that got improved. Um, another thing that was very noticeable at first, which I, I didn't really quite like at first, but it kind of grew on me, is... um the difficulty of the game is actually what I would think is significantly harder than Breath of the Wild. Um, cause it felt like in Breath of the Wild, you know, it kind of eases you into like with its difficulty, you know, it just gets gradually harder as the game goes on. But I felt that, um, in Tears of the Kingdom, I would often just get one shotted by a lot of enemies really early on. Uh, even with like a full set of armor, just because, um, you know, it's a sequel, it's not supposed to be quite as easy as the original, um, so, you know, that kind of grew on me, because I kind of appreciated how they weren't willing to just make it, like, as easy as the first one, so in a sense, it's kind of like the Master Quest type thing, where it's a little bit harder than the, uh, base thing, so it's, like, hard mode, basically, uh, but, I mean, it's kind of like going from Prime 1 to Prime 2, uh, where Prime 2 difficulty at the beginning is similar to, actually, the difficulty of the end of Prime 1, like, not quite as much, but, you know, they expect that pe people who play Metroid Prime 1 2 have already played Prime 1, you know, know the gist of gameplay, so it's not going to ease you into it, it's just going uh, for, you know, a decent amount of difficulty right at the very beginning of the game, and that's kind of the same thing that Tears of the Kingdom is going for, where they are um, hitting you with a little bit of more difficulty at the beginning of the game. So, another thing that is new to Tears of the Kingdom is the sky and the depths, um... Which, I think both of them are cool, but honestly, I still think 
like the Hyrule Overworld is kind of the better of the two, but I still think that this edition is um really really nice. And one thing in particular I was really impressed with is um when you compare like the game file sizes, Breath of the Wild is like 14 and a half gigabytes, and then Tears of the Kingdom is like right at right under 16, so that can fit on the standard Nintendo Switch uh, cartridge. But uh, I was impressed of how they were able to compress like so much of the stuff like the sky and the Nether like with just like that little like gigabyte and a half of more data that's being used i thought that was just nice because you know nintendo is good at compressing their games very well um another thing that i really liked uh, i mean the story in general is really good but i think what i like more than the story in itself is um kind of just a giant lore bomb that has just been dropped in this game um because like i'd find myself like thinking later i was like Oh yeah, the boss from Tower of the Gods and Wind Waker looks a lot like a Zonai robot from, you know, this game. And then I was just thinking, maybe that means that the Tower of the Gods in Wind Waker was created by the Zona Zonai. And, you know, this is a lot of lore comes from this, and I think it's all really interesting. Um, so another thing that I really liked was that the final boss was a lot better in this than in Breath of the Wild. Because Breath of the Wild, I mean, it was a, it's a great game, but its final boss is is kind of a letdown because uh calamity ganon is kind of easy and beast form ganon is uh, a joke it's just a playable cutscene. it's like super duper easy but i do think that the final boss is actually reasonably more challenging uh, like as you would expect from a final boss uh in a zelda game but yeah i just thought that was just a nice improvement and speaking of improvements i think that the overall um dungeons as you would call them um are better than their breath of the wild counterparts because you know in breath of the wild you have the uh divine beasts which let's be real they weren't super great as a dungeon for the game but i mean they they were still fine but i still think i think that the temples from tears of the kingdom do a much better job of you know going back to that original zelda dungeon style um other than the fire temple because that one was a pain in the butt but um yeah over overall they were all pretty nice um i mean as you would expect this is a zelda game it's made by nintendo you know it's it's just a really great game overall but uh going into things that i didn't really like so into the cons um i think that i know that covid got in the way of them you know like delayed the game a good bit but um i still think that like a lot of the reused assets um this it it made me feel like i was just playing like breath of the wild again but like with a little bit of a change of the story and a little bit more like areas to explore like the depth depths and the sky because like they reuse so many assets but like like for instance like i think it, like even like the bare minimum they could have done is like at least uh changed up the soundtrack a lot which most of the time it's I think exactly identical to Breath of the Wild. If there is any differences, I couldn't tell. Um, Cause I mean, there's a six year gap between Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. And you look at Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, where there's a one year gap and the soundtracks in between the two are completely separate. Like they are completely new. Um, but I, yeah, but I mean like, also I'm just like, in terms of like reusing things, the amount of characters that are actually relevant to the story that are like there's not that many new ones except for like the but the people from the past like in the zonai and then you go to the present where people you know you actually interact with the people that are actually relevant to the story the only ones that are actually like new are joshu um and teba's son and that's pretty much it other than you know like obviously ganondorf but, like, really, it's just those two that you can actually interact with a lot. So, it's, 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 they didn't really change a whole lot in terms of, like, the new cast of main characters, which I was a little bit disappointed in. I would have liked if uh, some new characters would have gotten a little bit of a spotlight. But, oh well. Um, just as a comparison to Breath of the Wild, I think that the Pura Pad is actually um, not that great compared to the Sheikah Slate. Because I kind of like how versatile you could use the Sheikah Slate. Like, you can use it a lot for combat. Um, like, the stasis. And you can use bombs for combat. Uh, but with the Pura Pad, you 
you can really only just like fuse weapons together in order to make them stronger and that's about it for combat unless you're like building a like a vehicle that can attack people but i mean i just think that the sheikah slate's a lot more versatile because you could you know bomb yourself across the map so you have that mobility aspect um but yeah overall i would say i prefer the sheikah slate but you know you can build some really nice stuff with the uh, pura pad and the his new right hand so i mean it's it's not all bad um another thing i would say is uh I kind of prefer the story to Breath of the Wild more. I think the the story that they have in Tears of the Kingdom, like it's it it serves its purpose. It's all right, but um, I still think the kind of aspects of Breath of the Wild, where it's like Link trying to own up to his own mistakes and failures a hundred years ago, while also trying to regain his memories, is a lot more impactful on me than this sort of new one where it's just like, oh, I need to find Zelda, and then he kind of finds the past memories of Zelda all over the place until he can kind of put all the pieces together. So I think that this is uh, just like this lack of Link kind of like the lack of Link's redemption is kind of pushes me towards this Breath of the Wild side of its story. But I mean, overall, it's not like the story is bad. It's just I prefer Breath of the Wilds. Um, but yeah, I just think overall it's it's really similar to Breath of the Wild. Um, and I think what this leads to is when I was playing, I really just felt like I was just playing like a mod of Breath of the Wild, like, this is just a mod with, like, a ton of new content, which, honestly, when I'm playing a sequel, especially when I'm playing, when I'm paying $70 for, that, that's not really the feeling I want to get, so I kind of, this was thinking about this for a while, and I was like, why, why does this feel like this, and it's just that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom are just really too similar, they're really just companion pieces, and so what happens is that even though Tears of the Kingdom is really supposed to be its own standalone game, it really just has its I, this identity crisis where it just is trying to attack. It's just trying to be too much like Breath of the Wild, where it just doesn't feel like it can be its own thing. So, for example, I'm going to bring up Ocarina of Time Majora's Mask. Like that game was made in under a year, yet Majora's Mask has a completely different gameplay style and a di very different feel because you know. Majora's Mask is obviously much darker narratively than uh, Ocarina of Time. And, you know, very different mechanics. Because where in Ocarina of Time, you're going back and forth from seven years in the past where Link is almost an adult. He's 16 years old. From going from nine years old, going back and forth, back and forth. Majora's Mask, you can only recycle the three days. So once the three days is up, you have to go back. Everything you did is undone, but except for the things that you now know. And the masks you collect. But I feel like really gameplay wise like outside of like things like um places you can go to and like what you can do with the sheikah slate and the pura pad and the uh raru's arm with link it's it's basically identical gameplay wise and i think that just kind of disappointed me more than anything that we had to wait six years for it really just felt like a really big dlc kind of like um going from spider-man um to miles morales like it's it's the same thing but like you know a little bit of differences in gameplay it just it just feels like a big mod with a different story it's like the same used overworld except i was a bit more forgiving when playing miles morales because um i did prefer the game the battle gameplay more you know and it didn't take like um six years to make it was let's see 20, spider-man came out in 2018 i think and then miles morales came out in 2020 so it was just a two-year gap from the you know make a new story improve the combat and that's pretty much it and change the setting to winter but that's just my opinion. I mean, obviously, you know, that's just my thoughts on it. But yeah, another thing that I didn't really like um, was the fact that they kind of nerfed every single weapon in the game to make fusing things to your weapons viable. So like, for instance, in Breath of the Wild, you're... The Master Sword could have a damage stat of 120 when it's fully maxed out through the DLC trials. But in Tears of the Kingdom, to actually make um, the Master Sword decently powerful, you have to fuse like tough things to it. I usually do diamonds because um, they're durable. But um, you have to like fuse things to it to make it stronger again. And then they just go away once you know the durability of the Master Sword breaks and you have to wait for it to recharge again. So I think that the fact that 
they had to do this to like every single weapon in the game is they had to like decrease its uh, attack stat so that it would make fusion viable is just not that nice i feel like it was kind of like a waste of a uh, ability um just throwing out a couple things i forgot to mention earlier um i think that the shrines overall are you know of the same quality as breath of the wild i think they're you know a nice little thing to learn how to use your um uh pura pad and um raru's arm better um similar to how the shrines in breath of the wild helped you to use the sheikah slate better um and the fact that they added light roots which are kind of like the counterparts of shrines to kind of eliminate the depths i think is also a nice little objective um but yeah um korok seeds are also a thing that um are significantly more annoying than in the original um so i'm not a huge fan of that um and yeah i think that's about it for everything i forgot to talk about back to the original recording but yeah i mean overall I, it's a zelda game so it's still fantastic um, I'm gonna give it a 6 out of 7, um, just cause, you know, I did have a lot to say in, in regards to, you know, problems I had with it, but, like, it's still a really good Zelda game, and at the end of the day, I still feel like this is more of a companion piece game rather than a full-blown sequel in, in my mind, you know, kind of like how, um, uh, the Oracle games are companion pieces to each other, that's kind of how I'm feeling about, you know, Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, like, these two just go hand in hand together, so... But yeah, um, I'm a bit concerned about future Zelda titles, because honestly, while I do think that this open world approach was a nice, nice breath of fresh air, um, I don't want that to be the future of the series. So if that, I think that it should, re you know, return more to a classic formula, whether that's top down or, you know, like more like a normal 3D Zelda, but <clears throat> I, I don't think it should be gone for good, but I know um, I think it should wait. You know, like maybe like two or three get mainline games before we get a new open world one, and hopefully, uh, you know, they do it with like a new cast of characters with a new Link and Zelda. Because I don't think, honestly, I don't want them milking this you know generation of Zelda anymore. Because that's kind of what it felt like they did. Is they realized, oh, Breath of the Wild was super duper popular. Let's uh, make a sequel uh, to get more money out of it. But, I mean, that's just kind of how I imagined that went down. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I'll probably, I'm going to put up my current, like, list of, like, what I think the best Zeldas are. Um, you know, putting Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom right next to each other because I think they're sort of companion pieces. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's just kind of my thoughts on it. And, yeah, that's it for the video. Um, let me know what y'all thought in the comments. It's just really what I'm curious about is what other people think about it. Uh, but yeah, just, you know, let me know what you thought. See you later next time. Bye.